I can see lots and lots of names today. Um, and I'm really pleased that you've been able to join us uh, in another one of our implementation seminars and to hear Kate Beckett, because she really has some very exciting things to say. Um, Kate asked me to, to tell you how uh, John and I first met her, uh, which is slightly embarrassing, really, because we met her because she'd read our book and she thought it was a good read. Um, we met her in Costa Coffee in those days when you could actually meet up with people just outside the station in Southampton. So it wasn't a very salubrious start, but we've had a, a fantastic um, few years getting to know Kate and her work better uh, and even participating in a little bit of it. So it gives me absolute pleasure today to welcome Kate to, to our series. She's just completed her Knowledge Mobilisation Research Fellowship. And I think she'll talk quite a lot about that. So that will be really interesting. And, and for me, her work has been absolutely pioneering in terms of bringing the fascinating world of arts-based uh, knowledge mobilization a little bit more into our everyday lives. And she's here to do that today over our seminar. So thank you, Kate, over to you. I'm really looking forward to it, as is everybody here. Thank you, Andre. That's very kind of you. Um, so as Andre said, I've recently completed my NIHR Knowledge Mobilisation Research Fellowship, with, in which I was supported by Andre and John very, very helpfully. And I'm now a research fellow at the University of the West of England in Bristol. My academic background is in anthropology and psychology, and I also have extensive NHS clinical experience as a midwife and a nurse. So a sort of little bit of both. I do not have extensive experience of presenting on Zoom, so bear with me if there's a few glitches. So I'm going to start my presentation now and here it is. Ooh. And I seem to be on the wrong page, so I'm just going to go back to the right page and start from the beginning. So my presentation is entitled Arts-Based Knowledge Mobilisation Strategies and Their Impact. It comes in three parts. So in the first part, I'm going to talk about arts-based knowledge mobilization strategies. I wish I could think of a shorter way of saying that because it's quite a mouthful, but I'm going to try and keep up with it. Um, in the second part, I'm going to show you that epic film, as promised. And in the third part, I'm going to talk a little bit about capturing the impact of this type of work. But first, I'm going to do a quick recap on mind lines and knowledge mobilization, which some of you will have come across. It's important to inform the rest of my presentation. Some of you may not have done, and in which case I say, get out there and find out more, because it's all really good stuff. Anyway, what are mind lines? So mind lines were John and Andre's um, sort of, they developed the notion of, of um, clinical mind lines from extensive ethnographic research. And mind lines are what practitioners use to inform their clinical decision making. They contain a complex array of rapidly accessible internalized knowledge, including tacit knowledge, um, research knowledge, and experiential knowledge. Mind lines are transmitted using social means within practitioners' communities of practice. And they're actively applied in the context of their use and tested. They're dynamic, they're flexible, and they are necessary to equip practitioners with the contextual adroitness required to meet healthcare's multiple realities and demands. Well, I suppose this poses a problem for traditional research, which generally seeks to control for extraneous and contextual variables, to generate scientific facts, and which is usually disseminated via reports and guidelines. Furthermore, the mind lines work reminds us that practitioners' minds are not empty vessels waiting for research evidence, rather they're full of competing or complementary knowledge. So really, the challenge for improving the quality of healthcare by means of research is to replicate the forms of knowledge and transmission means in which mind lines are effectively learned, modified and applied. So new tools and methods for communicating research and integrating it into practitioners' mind lines are required. So this challenge has been taken up by researchers in the field of knowledge mobilisation. And what we find here that knowledge mobilization approaches, unlike traditional research or dissemination activities, actively seek to bring diverse communities together to share their knowledge to catalyze change. Knowledge mobilization is therefore well suited to enhancing mind lines and hence practice. 
since their effectiveness relies on similar things, diverse evidence, opportunities for social interaction and active testing and implementation. And I want to sort of re-emphasize those three things. I think if you take away nothing else from this talk, those are the really key things. Different communities, diverse knowledge and active, active interaction with that knowledge and with each other. The one strand of knowledge mobilization which is gaining popularity, especially in healthcare, is the use of cre creative means to communicate research, many of which incorporate these three vital elements. And they also have some other tricks up their sleeves, which you'll, I'll tell you about later. So, what are arts based knowledge mobilization strategies or arts based knowledge translation tra strategies as they generally refer to? It's really not easy to get that out of my mouth, but I'm going to say, <laughs> you'll just have to know that there's no shorthand for it as they're generally referred to in Canada, where they've been extensively used within healthcare to stimulate debate and communicate research. There's lots of different genres that have been used. Visual arts, drama, dance, photography, creative writing, or multimedia, a mixture of all of these. What advantages do they offer? Well, they generally use narrative and or storytelling to communicate research. And this has been shown, these have been shown to be important determiners of impact because stories resonate with human experience. They simultaneously evoke a rational and emotional response. And this creates the optimal conditions for catalyze change. We need moderate levels of stress to make us want to change something, not too much or too little. Creative genres are also more accessible to non-academic audiences, people of different cultures and abilities. They bring evidence alive and give it depth and meaning. They can bring diverse stakeholders together to share their knowledge and foster mutual understanding. It's also been found that creative genres can bring diverse and can help practitioners to critically reflect on the factors influencing their understanding, assumptions and practice. They can actually envisage what's happening now and also what possibly could happen in the future with just a little change. I think what's been particularly important for me and working with practitioners and patients is that creative genres are they are creative, they're new, they capture the imagination. And as one practitioner once said to me, it's not death by PowerPoint, which I mean, this is a PowerPoint slide, so I apologize if I am, this is death by PowerPoint, but that's, that's really key. It's something different and it's more akin to what goes on in the real world, in practitioner's real world. And most importantly, arts-based knowledge mobilization strategies have been shown to the extend the reach and impact of research. So, which one should you use if you were thinking of using one? This slide is adapted from Kukonen and Cooper's 2018 a ABKT planning framework, which highlights a number of factors that you might want to consider. What are the project goals? Do you just want to raise awareness and stimulate debate, in which case you might use videos or social media to put information out there. The problem with that is you don't have any sort of interaction with your audience, that it's a very good way of raising awareness, stimulating debate, but perhaps you might want something more interactive that can um, support implementation, influence policy, help with the co-production of ideas. So think about what your goals are. Think about the audience, who's the target audience? Are you thinking about just engaging with one set type of people, say for example, patients who've experienced a particular condition, or are you thinking about engaging with diverse audiences? So you need to think again, so, so what genre is going to help you achieve your goals with the audience that you're targeting? Another thing that, 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 that um, Kukon and Kupo point out is that you need to think about who might be interested in collaborating with you. So that could be creative partners. I mean, when I first came to this sort of type of research, you know, I, I like to think I'm a reasonably creative person, but I have no experience with art space, knowledge mobilization strategies, with drama, not, not in terms of my work. So you need to find some people who've got that expertise that you can work with, but also thinking about the organizations, their capacity, their funds, who might want to work with you and what will make it more attractive for them to do so. The, finally, what, what the 
planning framework suggests is you think about impact and I think that's really interesting you think about it at the planning stage which impact indicators can you use to evidence the impact of your research you know possibly you're interested in reach so for example if you were using video just to put information out there you might want to track how many people access that and like it you might want to track its usefulness its accessibility which partnerships it, it, it helped you engage with or you might actually want to track commitment or actual change in practice or policy so thinking about all those things before you start is really important so when i came to my knowledge mobilization research fellowship project which is entitled so this is where the epic bit comes in the enhancing post-injury psychological intervention and care study and i do have a short abbreviation for that which is epic I was interested in using an arts-based knowledge mobilization approach which fitted with what we know about the content and transmission of mind lines. I wanted to see if we could use an approach that would enhance practitioner mind lines and hence practice. So three elements were key and going back to those three elements again, ability to portray diverse knowledge, ability to engage key communities and to provide a social interactive milieu in which to interrogate and combine knowledge and actively try out solutions. So those three components, again, diverse communities, diverse knowledge and active experimentation. So after I um, approached Andre and John to say, I love your mind line for work and this is what I'm thinking about. We had, coffee seems to be a, a real thread here, but we had another coffee about six weeks before I submitted my application. This time I think it was in Bath Costa at the station, I can't quite remember, but anyway, I said, look, this is, these are the three things I want to incorporate. What do you think I can do? And Andre had a, it was very quiet, and she had a little twinkle in her eye, and she looked at John and said, are you thinking what I'm thinking? And I think it were, and she said, forum theatre. And you're going to hear a lot more about forum theatre in the film that you'll see in a minute. But um, so I'm just going to now talk briefly about this is a very busy slide, but I'm going to talk you through it. But anyway, at that stage, EPIC six stage method, including forum theatre, was conceived. And EPIC was um, supported throughout and beforehand by an active patient practitioner advisory group. I've been working on a previous study called the Impact of Injury Study, and so a number of patients and practitioners wrote off to me afterwards and said, if you want to do my more work, we're in, which was absolutely wonderful. So they were there right from the start, and they helped in developing, they and my academic mentors helped in developing this six stage um, method. So just very briefly, you know, what EPIC aimed to do was to capture three different perspectives on patient, um, injured patient psychological um, needs and care. Patient narratives, practitioner mind lines, research and expert evidence. So in stage one, we use focus groups, interviews and literature reviews to capture these three different perspectives. In stage two, and remembering that patient practitioner advisory group were there all the way helping with each stage so they were fully involved in co-producing this research. So stage two, use framework analysis to systematically combine these three perspectives and identify how and where they differed in ways that were important for injured adult psychological outcomes. Stage four, invite patients, practitioners and research audience to connect with each other's experience and knowledge at a workshop using forum theatre techniques. Stage five, use the play and forum theatre workshop to catalyze debate and experiment with ideas. And then at the end, we looked at what had changed as the result of this. So that was how EPIC worked. I'm now going to show you the EPIC film, which tells you more about EPIC's methods, about forum theatre, and it's fit with the Mindlines model. And it's also to give you a taste of some of the outcomes of it. Afterwards, I'm going to introduce to you to a framework for capturing the impact of this work. Now, I did have a bit of a problem with sound on this beforehand. So I'm going to give it a go. If there's any problem with sound, I hope somebody will let me know. So I'm going to stop showing the slides now and I'm going to hopefully get the film going. And it is here. And I just need to make sure that you can all uh, share computer sound. There we are. So sit back and enjoy the film. It lasts about 40 minutes. 
interesting to watch a patient's story in theatre format. It makes it real and tangible. It's an open, engaging approach to involving and empowering people with personal experience in the development of services. It provided a powerful stimulus for change. One of the best pieces of research I've been involved in, engaging and real. As both a clinician and an academic, it was an entirely novel experience. So I moved from somebody who was slightly skeptical to somebody thinking this has got some real value. We're currently spending eight billion pounds on health research in the UK per year. Much of that has very little impact, direct impact on patient care. What you tend to get as academics is you push out your information and you don't bring it together communities. You don't try to catalyze change and it just goes nowhere. And we know that scientific research has the potential to improve the quality of care, but actually on its own, it's probably not sufficient to do that because it's generally generated external to the context in which it needs to be used. And actually practitioners, patients know an awful lot about what needs to happen as well. So it's about realising potential of all those different forms of knowledge to work together to improve patient care. In thinking about how to combine different forms of knowledge to sort of, in a, in a sense, to amplify what they could do in terms of improving patient care, came to the idea of forum theatre, which has been used in lots of settings to affect change, but not so often in the NHS because it's a and we're presenting diverse knowledge in a real embodied form. A shift usually starts at 7am and can last for about 12 hours. Another reason for using Forum Theatre was its fit with MindLines research. This research shows that effective practice depends on multiple forms of knowledge, including research, and is best learnt using social means. Forum Theatre explicitly enables people to work with diverse forms of knowledge to come up with creative solutions. In this case, patient, practitioner and research evidence could be presented simultaneously. Um, what I think Forum Theatre actually did beautifully was it brought together those different communities. Forum Theatre is more than just a play. The first step involves developing a performance based on diverse people's experience of an issue of importance to them where something needs to change. In this case, the poor uptake of evidence regarding post-injury psychological care. Then, you invite an audience of people for whom the issue resonates. The audience watch the play straight through. They discuss what they have seen and share their own knowledge. But performance two is where things really start to happen. This time, the audience is invited to stop the play and to reenact elements to see if they can individually or collectively alter the outcome. In the final step, they co-produce a list of key recommendations to improve care. In forum theatre, we're not so interested in stories that already have happy and satisfactory endings. In forum theatre, we're more interested in stories that don't yet have happy and satisfactory endings, and we use it and your expertise and your experience and your ideas to see how we might get to the happy and satisfactory endings that we might want different to the one that we're about to see. The forum theatre process is quite a unique way of undertaking a research project, which is what this is essentially, uh, because it's very much grounded in the experiences and perspectives of both patients and healthcare professionals and researchers. So it's bringing in the evidence with different people's experience to then try to take that experience or those experiences forward to benefit healthcare in this particular instance and that is quite unusual in research. So it was common ground for professionals and for patients which was what we were trying to achieve. So trying to find out what was happening on both sides of the story. It's a very complex environment the NHS so it wasn't about coming along and saying I've got this piece of research and I think you need to do this. It was saying I'd like to understand what you know about this subject too and when we put all our heads together can we come up with solutions. So we hope to improve 
improve that, but also to test whether Forum Theatre may be something that could be used more generally as a service improvement model or to take knowledge closer to where it needs to work. So what we wanted to do was to create a, a play or an intervention that could be used more widely. And so rather than drawing the information from our play from a particular community, we drew it from systematic research. So that's quite unusual. And so what that involved was interviewing multiple patients and practitioners, running focus groups and a literature review. And we put all that information together into a play, a blended story that told the patients story from the day before injury until 12 months later. The way that the research was embedded into the piece was is that there were flashes of research-based evidence that were put on a screen. And what I think that that did is, is that if it had just been the theater performance, uh, we would have started to move away from the whole research aspect of it. But because this research information was being drip-fed in, it did mean that we kept going back to the research evidence, which is a way of grounding it. The play wasn't just a play that anybody had written, that it had been based on interviews and, um, you know, so therefore you, you know that it's an evidence-based play. It resonated with me and I wanted to know more about it. In order to make this method work, we invited a combined audience of patients, practitioners and researchers. So in a sense, those people reflected the same people who informed the play. They were the people for whom it was going to be meaningful and the people who had a real vested interest in making something improve. So the first performance um, shows straight through at the play as we've devised it, unedited. It's been a tough year leading up to the accident. My mum had died. She'd been suffering from depression. Suddenly, my wheel got stuck in a rut. Ah! Oh, oh, watch it! Oh. Watch it! I remember falling to the ground and hitting myself on this side and rolling. I loved how it took an individual patient's story and then expanded that out to explore the the themes um, around, around injury and psychological impact of injury. That was really fantastic. After the first performance, the facilitator prompted debate about what the audience had seen. Consider a couple of things. On Rachel's behalf, our patient perspective, what do you think it is that Rachel wants or needs in this story? What are the obstacles or challenges or barriers that get in Rachel's way as she tries to get what she needs or wants? So you really got people to think, really using their own knowledge and experience to put themselves into that actor's place and say, if I was her, what would I need? And I think that was a really useful way of stimulating debate and getting people to really think more broadly about what they'd just seen. So the second performance is really where all that knowledge gets sort of stirred up and put to work and that's the really interesting bit with Forum Theatre. So you've presented people with a, a play that where the outcomes are poor and you invite them to, to interact with it, to alter outcomes. And so the second performance, you actually rerun the play, only the audience can become the actors, they can take the place of an actor. Where do you want to take it from to show us your idea? Well, it, it was just the way he approached it. Really. Take it from that point, to see what's different this time. It took Go. two hours before he arrived. <laughs> Hello, um, what's your name? When I stop the story and say, right, who agrees with this, who doesn't agree with this, right, come and change it. That was brilliant, because people were like, yeah, I can do this, I know what I'm doing. The really exciting sort of part of the interaction between the actors and the audience came when people were actually going on stage or directing what they wanted to see happening. What was different that time? He asked her name. What else was different that time? What was different about the approach? Well, it was warm and friendly, and I think it made the patient feel quite secure. <laughs> Rachel or the nurse? So, see what's different this time. You get to see what your intervention might do as an individual and the facilitator then very skillfully involves the audience into discussing, well, has that person suggested made any difference? Is it feasible? And I think within the NHS that's particularly important. We probe and say, well, that's great, we've made things better for this patient. 
would that really work? And you get this lovely dynamic discussion. Oh, there's some people at desk that might be able to help you. I'm just patient at the moment. Well, I'll go and ask for the desk. <laughs> I saw consultants taking part and patients taking part and it was nice to see that sort of collaboration between the two of them. And it also makes the people watching, I think probably takes things, take things in a lot more than if you just sat and watched it and then went away. The recommendations that came out of the workshop were generally quite practical. Whether they'll be implemented remains to be seen, but there were things like having psychological champions in each clinical area. After the first workshop, we were invited to run a second one in the Major Trauma Network Hospital. In this case, rather than presenting the research evidence as black and white slides between each scene, we decided to simulate an interview between an experienced practitioner and an expert in post-injury psychopathology. This seemed to work really well, and the research evidence was much better integrated into subsequent discussions and reenactments. So rerunning the workshop gave us an ideal opportunity to test our idea that this intervention could be used in different contexts and with different audiences and come up with equally valuable evidence-informed recommendations. But these would be what, according to what was possible in the local context. I think forum theatre is something that's adaptable and you could use it for other things. I mean, there's lots of stories out there and you can adapt it to any part of healthcare. As a clinician looking after major trauma victims on a daily basis, there were so many things that I could take away to my clinical practice. It would just trigger your brain in, when you're actually in the process of doing it. Um, it would just, I imagine it would just set, set you know, remind you that, you know, that this could be done slightly differently. People tend to focus on the facts and the figures, the evidence, in order to try to change people's minds. And um, what Forum Theatre really demonstrated beautifully is how much if you do not have that emotional kick, if you don't have that emotional pull, you're not going to get the change you need. Hello, Doctor. Hello. Thank you. So I see you've been to the GP for surgery quite a lot in the last nine months. It's not going well. No? No, it's not going well. Okay. I can't move. I'm in pain. I'm round with my husband. I need help. If I'd had to read a review article around this issue, would it have had the same impact as attending Forum Theatre? Well, no, I can confidently say not. Uh, and I think that's because of the patient story and recognising from the theatre itself those themes that come across in, in everyday practice that aren't, you can't possibly reflect through writing down on a piece of paper. Actually seeing things in action and seeing it in front of you and being engaging with the patients and the practitioners is brilliant. You end up with something that can be taken into practice and is feasible to do and practical to do in our current NHS. All the press releases, all the scientific journals, all of that stuff doesn't make very much difference at all. I think it is moving forward in a direction we need to go in. It completely changed how I spoke to my patients. I have explored with my consultant colleagues uh, this issue as a direct result of taking part in the research workshop. I have reflected on past experiences when I may not have appreciated the distress the patient was actually going through. I learned quite a lot needs to change to make the patient feel secure. We're hoping to implement the majority of the workshop recommendation into our trauma service, but it will take time. I was already aware and keen to improve service, but the workshop gave me some positive directions and insight into patients' needs. I've incorporated the psychological impact of injury into a master's level clinical training module I'm As teaching. a direct result of this workshop, we've developed a new patient and family liaison support service run by clinicians. We're developing a patient discharge leaflet with signs to look out for and signposting to sources of support. All the patients who have attended have expressed interest in contributing to further research. I realise I have been suffering from PTSD and referred myself for support. It enabled me to develop interest at management level because they're now keen to support and improve the way we address post-injury needs. It will help inform development of our new major trauma psychologist role. It's enlightened certain aspects of care that I realise I must keep in the forefront of my mind.
So that was the film. I hope you enjoyed it. We were very lucky to have some really wonderful film producers to make that film with us. And also just a big thank you to Cardboard Citizens, who are the UK's leading proponents of foreign theatre. They've been working for 25 years in um, with homeless people in London and they supported this work. In fact, after speaking with John and Andre um, about what approach to use, I had six weeks to submit my fellowship application and so I just went on Google, put forward theatre and found Cardwood Citizen and spoke to Tony McBride, the practitioner you saw there, the Forum Theatre facilitator, and said, would you like to work with me? And he said yes. And that's something about the flexibility and the imagination of people who work in those sort of um, organisations. And it's been absolutely amazing working with them and it's worth checking up on the rest of their work. But anyway, as you can see, Epic's approach led to a range of impacts and in fact analysis and further interviews suggest that there have been many many more. However there's a bit of a problem with capturing the impact of this kind of research and it can be challenging and it's often neglected so it's quite hard to demonstrate its value. I think this is in part due to the way the impact is currently conceived and measured and due to the fundamentally different ways in which these approaches work. For example we tend to assume that impact that happens at the end of a project linear and finite. Impacts related to the specific aims outlined at the beginning of the project are regarded as the only ones of importance. Furthermore, we tend to assume impact occurs from the micro to macro levels, so you alter policy through guidelines or, or systematic research and that filters down to the bottom to, to practitioners on the coalface working with patients and as a practitioner my myself and from my research I can say that doesn't always work. Um, this neglects the more diffuse multi-level and potentially transformative impacts which ensue from and with, within co-produced research. These are hard to demonstrate as there are limited means to systematically and comprehensively capture them. So last year, the well, year before I think now, Andre, I and three other colleagues set out to develop the Social Impact Framework or SIF which I always think sounds a bit like Star Wars, but anyway, the SIF, S-I-F, as a means to capture the impact of co-produced research. That's the cue for my next set of slides, which I'm just going to show you. I hope you're still all there. I, I, you, I could be talking to a vacuum, but I'm assuming you're all there still. So where is my next set of research slides? Share, capturing the impact of co-produced research. So here we go. Okay, a brief introduction to the social impact framework. So Andre, I and our co-authors, we developed the social impact framework through a series of author workshops where we systematically analyse the impact of case studies from our own co-produced research. What we found was that within co-produced research, impact occurs at multiple levels due to knowledge sharing and production, productive interaction. It could be tangible, intellectual and relation, re relational. It often starts at a micro level, i.e. in the individual, and then combines to seed higher level impacts, especially where impacts combine with other policy initiatives or practice priorities. Within co-produced research, impact is dynamic and cyclical, it's not linear and finite. It occurs, occurs both within and beyond the research. And what we also found was that impacts at one level or on one individual often became a mechanism for impact on another and vice versa. So to capture the impact of co-produced research, it's really important to trace who was involved and how, what was the impact on them and of their involvement and the mechanisms that enabled that impact to happen and enabled the research to happen. Sounds a bit confusing, I know, but the following slides pose a series of questions and, and uses examples from EPIC to show how the SIF works. So the first thing to, it's important to understand is what is impact? We need to move away from our narrow restrictive de definitions of impact. To think of impact as a much broader thing. It can be tangible. We think like guidelines, a forum theatre workshop, journal articles, reports, it can also be intellectual, shifts in the way people think, learning about how other people think, and relational, developing communities, developing networks, developing people who might want to work with you in the future people who feel safe in talking to you. It's also important to distinguish between and 
between and to connect different forms of impact, including outputs. So outputs are things like products, such as, like, like I said, the tangible outcomes of research, journal articles, conference presentations. Then there's the uses, practical, instrumental, conceptual or symbolic use of research outputs. So what do you do with those outputs and what they make? They, and then finally, you need to think about the outcomes. What changed as a result of the use of an output? It could be practice, it could be structures, norms or culture, and relational and intellectual outcomes too. So the next step in thinking about the impact of this sort of research is to think who was involved in the research co-production at each level. So which individuals, groups or organisations were involved and who were they? For example, did the research co-production involve individuals, groups, organisations or infrastructural actors such as think tanks or policy makers? So really try and trace who was involved. For example, in healthcare research, this often includes academics, researchers, patients, practitioners, families and carers or commissioners. In EPIC, as you going back to that flowchart earlier, the, the patient practitioner advisory group were involved where individuals were involved in this research, groups of stakeholders attended the workshops, representatives of multiple academic and NHS organisations were there. Why is it important to know this? It's important because impact can occur and be created by all contributors at every level, so we need to know who or what was involved. The next question we need to think about when capturing the impact of co-produced research is how and at what stage were these individuals, these different communities involved? Was it just in the design phase or was it throughout? Did, um, did they have an active part in it? Were they equal co-production partners or did they just participate in minor elements? It's important to actually think about what they did. Why is, again, why is that important? Because mapping their involvement and contribution to the research um, can help you to assess the impact as, 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 sorry, I'm going to start that one again. It's important as impact can occur within, fr from and beyond all these stages within co-produced research, not just, it's a cyclical thing. It's not just at the end of the research. For example, you know, within, within um, EPIC, the patient practitioner advisory group were involved they were involved from before we even thought about the study and they were involved throughout. And so you, one might expect that they both generated some impact and it also impacted on them. Um, the, the, the audience members who came to the Forum Theatre workshop, they were involved in one, one particular part. But again, it will have impacted on all of them at some level and they will have then taken away that impact to share with their colleagues, families and friends. So just to recap a bit, to retrace the impact of co-produced research, we first need to, we need to record throughout and beyond the research project, not just thinking about what's the impact at the end and have we done what we set out to do. At each level, the individual, the group, organisational or societal level, we need to record who was involved. How and in what research phases were they involved? And what was the impact of their involvement, of these individuals, these groups' involvement in the different stages of the research? We also need to consider, and this is really important, like I said at the beginning, that sometimes we found that impacts could, could become impacts on one individual or one group could become a mechanism on um, which made more impact occur to another individual or another group. I'm going to give you some examples soon because that will really help. I'm sure I'm running away with myself a little bit here. So the next thing I think it's really important to understand is which mechanisms, activities or elements enabled the co-produced research to occur and create impact at each level. For example, it could be good communication, it could be shared ownership, it could be a topic that was really significant to all. What enabled it to happen? What enabled those people to take part in the co-produced research? And what did, how did that affect the impact on them and from them? And it's also really important to consider um, 
within co-produced research that these aren't linear or simple chains of causation. Quite often, the impact can be quite quite erratic, quite random, non-linear chains of causation. And within there's some very good examples of that within Epic. For example, um, a couple of the participants at the Epic workshop found it really, really powerful the way we conveyed both clinical research and experiential reality simultaneously. And one of them said that she had taken that away, she was a commissioner, she had taken that away and was using that to inform her communication with, um, with service providers. Another one said that she had integrated elements of what she'd learned about the way of presenting information and the types of information that were important into delirium prevention guidelines. Now those aren't things that we set out to do, but because of the way in which everyone interacted, those were non-linear impacts of this research. And it can go the other way as well. And I think one of the things I found really powerful about this work was that throughout the EPIC study, I quite intentionally presented feedback to multiple groups of practitioners and patients throughout the research really to engage them in helping me with understanding what was going on, understanding why things didn't improve, but also to engage them in the research so they felt some sense of ownership. And one of the things that practitioners seemed to find really, really helpful was the talking about mind lines, just as I had when I first um, encountered John and Andre's book. It seemed to validate their knowledge, validate the fact that they needed all these different forms of knowledge, and validate the fact that the context sometimes inhibited them from implementing research. And what that did in terms of thinking about non-linear chains of causation is that I really had a group of practitioners who were very, very, very um, engaged with this research and they talked to other practitioners. So when it came to recruiting people to come to the workshop, I found that managers were actually quite happy to give people time off, give people time. They actually proactively said, I want my people to be there. Again, that's a non-linear chain of causation. I didn't do that intentionally, but because of the way in which that interaction with them affected them, they all came along to the workshops. So that would be an impact that we would definitely want to capture. So the next slide, really thinking about the EPIC study. I'm not sure I've talked enough about what some of the impacts were, and I think it's really important. I'm just going to stress first that we're not talking about the fact that these impacts, these relational intellectual impacts are more important than tangible. We're just saying they complement each other. We should be considering them all. EPIC had very many tangible impacts um, on, on practice and research, but it also had this host of rather less, um, rather more diffuse relational and intellectual impacts. But anyway, so looking at EPIC, I'm talking, going back to the mechanisms that will really seem to make this project work and also to create impact. Um, those that were key pre-workshop, I think co-production, the fact that we worked with the patient practitioner advisory group meant that all the study resources, all the methods, everything was informed by those different voices. There were two patients, two practitioners and two researchers on that group. And we all worked together to make sure those three voices were central to everything we did. Another thing, the significance and relevance of the topic. So this topic, all my research has suggested is hugely important to patients, it's hugely important to practitioners. The research evidence is unequivocal that we should be attending to injured patients' psychological needs, and yet everyone consensually knows that we're not doing enough. And so that was a real, really good mechanism in terms of making this work. Um, and again, as I said just now, I think the reg regular feedback to stakeholders meant it was a two-way thing. I got more information from them about what we might need to do in the future and about what their perspectives were. They felt engaged and they had some ownership of it and so they came along to the workshops. In terms of mechanisms, important key mechanisms in the forum theatre workshops, diverse evidence. I think, you know, going back to the very earlier slides when I was saying about knowledge mobilisation, I think the fact that we combined experiential, contextual and research evidence was immensely powerful for people. It felt real. It felt like, you know, we've all been patients. We've all experienced the NHS. It felt like this was actually what happens. I think um, 
diverse communities. One of the things that people mentioned in feedback was it was so wonderful to talk to each other and to see each other's humanity, to develop mutual understanding of each other's worlds. In fact, one patient heard back, she said, when I saw a nurse cry, when I, she saw the play, I realized she was human and I really wanted to, I really wanted to talk to, to understand her world. Another really key mechanism ethic was, like I said at the beginning, story acted as an emotional trigger. It created moderate stress. And that was essential to people thinking, you know, this isn't something, this isn't knowledge that I can just put aside and address another time. This is really important. It matters. Um, I think the other thing, for, it fostered collective debate and, act, and enabled active experimentation. And these things, you know, going back to the mechanisms that worked here, they're very similar to what I said about knowledge mobilization and mind lines. We actually use those, those drivers to affect change. And I think finally, I would just say that throughout EPIC, we had an explicit stance on the equality of different voices and their knowledge. And I think that's absolutely key that you can't pay token to that. You need to say, you know, actually your knowledge is as important as anyone else's. And without all those different forms of knowledge, we're not going to get anywhere. And I think that was very important. So I've nearly finished and I, I'm sure that I think this social impact framework, we are still experimenting with it. It's quite difficult to present, I think, and I would very much like some feedback on how this works when, 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 when I finish, but I'm just going to say it doesn't stop there, I'm afraid. There is another level of the SIF. So what, what we found while we were developing the framework is that research co-production can also lead to a fifth level of impact, which we named the paradigmatic level. In order to capture this level, you need to think, what was the combined impact of contributors, processes and mechanisms at all levels? What, what, what happened here? What, what, what if we, and this question invites you to look beyond the obvious impacts and to capture more subtle or covert things. These often start at individual levels and combine to see macro level changes. So an EPIC, I would suggest that uh, the paradigmatic chain, um, impacts that we notice is we change the way stakeholders view their knowledge and their relationship to research and to each other. We empowered individuals to use their knowledge to enact change, all things they didn't feel they had before. EPIC contributed evidence to back up people's tacit and experienced essential knowledge it gave them facts and figures that they could take to their managers and say, we need to do something about this. And I think it possibly shifted, a, it initiated a shift in participants' understanding about the relationship between psychological and physical disease. How do I know this? Because cumulatively, the feedback from EPIC suggests that, that a real shift happened here, that people felt very differently about their knowledge about the fact my knowledge matters, and if I use it, I might be able to change something. And that is really key. So I can see Andre nodding there, so I'm very relieved by that, because I think, um, you know, I'm not saying that in a vacuum, I really feel that happened. So I have nearly finished. This is really just to the grid that we developed within the social impact framework for, enabling others to capture the impact of co-produced research or creative genres as we use. I'm not going to go into that now, but it, it actually simplifies it. This, you just need to populate this and think very, very broadly about who was involved, what, how were they involved, what was the impact on them and what made that impact occur. And I think then we get a much richer perspective on what impact is and how we might um, initiate it, give rise to it, capture it. I'm sure I could give you many, many more references, um, and I'm very happy to speak to anyone afterwards, but these are just the basic ones that, that you know, the key ones that you might want, need to look at. And my acknowledgements are here, and now I think I'm going to sign off very shortly. I'm just going to come back so I'm on the screen now and say thank you so much for listening. I probably rushed through that rather quickly. Um, I really am quite a Zoom novice. I hope it was helpful. 
and I don't think I have all the answers. I just hope that I've initiated lots of more questions in you. Forum Theatre for me feels like the way forward. Um, it felt exciting and new and it really engaged with lots of people. It was great to work with people people who know how to do that stuff and have been doing it for a very long time and I think within healthcare we often feel we need to reinvent the wheel but actually people have been using this to create solutions to difficult problems for a long long time. That's me, done. Lovely, thank you. I'll give you a clap from everybody. And look, all the hands, I don't know if you can see, you've got clapping hands coming up all over the screen. Thank you very much, everyone. I'm, I'm sorry if the social impact framework was confusing. I think um, we still need to develop a simpler way of selling it to people, but I hope you'll have a look. Thank you. No, I think it's, it's really good to have um, um, the social impact model kind of talk, talk through and people can um, listen again uh, and also think about it and obviously read about it in the paper. But thank you, Kate for capitalising on the creative. You use those words right at the start and I think you did that excellently. Thank so you. really, really thank you. And also for helping us to see, hear and feel the potential impact of arts-based knowledge mobilisation approaches. Um, your film captures that, the, the vibrancy of, of that experience and the impact, the statements at the end of that film, we can really hear how people were altered by taking part in, in that exercise, which is quite, quite phenomenal, I think. Um, and I'm sure people will want to go back and, and hear them again at, at their leisure because they're very diverse. They go from individual right through to societal to paradigmatic as well. So absolutely fantastic impact, which I'm sure has altered all of our states today. So thank you. Anybody who wants to, to contact Kate, she put the email at the bottom of her um, talk and the last slide. The slides as usual will be posted as, as soon as um, Catherine gets them up there on, on the website, which is usually very, very quick. So um, please have a look again. Please tell all your friends who couldn't come today um, and your colleagues that Kate's presentation is up for, for the viewing. Um, and once again, Kate, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you all of, thank all of you and thank you for inviting me. It's a great pleasure.